And now today's word at the Key Church. Okay, so I've got a question for you this morning, folks. Are you comforted? I, I was speaking last week about comfort ye, comfort ye my people. So I want to ask you, are you comforted? Do you feel comforted? Are you enjoying the comfort that only the Holy Spirit can bring? And I want us to be a little bit real. We don't have to be uh, fake and false and put on a face. I tell you, there's times I myself am disquieted by all that's going on in the world. Where's my sound engineer? Dave, I'm a little loud. I'm a touch on the loud side. I, I want us to know the real comfort that comes from God. And if we are honest with ourselves, we're not always walking in that. So today I want us to look at, are there conditions to walk in the comfort of God? Because if there are, I want to know those conditions because that's what I want to walk in. That's what I'm seeking God for. So the scripture that I used last week uh, was, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, but the scripture for this week, because remember I told you there's seven weeks of comfort. That's the time, if you want to know what is the time clock, the prophetic time clock, the biblical time clock, we are in seven weeks of comfort. That's what the Lord says. Isaiah 49 verse 14. But Zion said, I don't get it. God has left me. My master has forgotten I even exist. Now come on, where's the honest people that can say, sometimes you feel like that. Sometimes uh, there's just many things that are weighing you down. Man, we've had a lot of things uh, weigh us down in the last week or two. I mean, everything that could break in our house was either broken or stolen. You know? Um, the devil's a liar, man. Uh, you know... Uh, not only did my uh, oven break when we had guests, but like the next day the dishwasher broke and, and just everything. Uh, and, and you say, Lord, I'm getting stressed by so many things. Just, But Zion said, I don't get it. God has left me. My master has forgotten I even exist. No, no, none of you are so human as me to ever think that. But I'm telling you, let's be real with each other, folks. Sometimes we do get into fear. We do lose our faith. Isaiah 49, verse 15, it carries on. It says, Can a mother forget the infant at her breast, walk away from the baby she bore? But even if mothers forget, I'll never forget you. And in the message version, it ends off uh, with a big stripe, and it says, Never again. Uh, never will God forget you. Even though a mother forget her child, God will not forget you. I want you to feel that comforter like syrup in this place today. Like in the atmosphere, the Spirit of God, thick like syrup. With the words of God, He will never, never, never forget you. So during the seven weeks of comfort, we are approaching the Feast of Trumpets. Okay? We, you have Rosh Hashanah, and then it's about two days later at the end of Rosh Hashanah, the end of uh, being in the, uh, starting the new year, you have the Feast of Trumpets. And the Bible teaches us that Jesus will return at the sound of the last trumpet. So which is the last trumpet? And how often then will the shofar be blown? So folks, uh, we are leading up to the 30 days that the shofar will be blown every single day in synagogues all around the world. 30 days of blowing the shofar. It's a warning that judgment is coming. It's a warning to us as the church. 
But it's also, it's the grace of God in these days of comfort to not just come and there was no warning. Not just come and people are not ready. No, we are in the season of comfort where God says, uh, while I'm comforting you, I'm also at the same time going to warn you that I am coming back again. So on the day of the Feast of Trumpets, the Jews blow the trumpet 100 times on that day. That's a lot of trumpet blowing. But one year is coming when the trumpet will blast a hundred times across the synagogues. And they blow it at specific times. So you can go on the web and you can see in this synagogue in West, uh, Western America, they blow it at that time. And then a bit later they'll blow it in East America. And so it goes all around the world. They blow it all at the same time. But there's coming a day when there will be 101 blasts, but the one blast at the end will not be in the synagogue. It will be in the clouds. It will be Jesus on a white horse with these trumpeters, and they will blow a sound that will be heard, I believe, well, uh, worldwide by the believers. In a twinkling of an eye, we will leave this old earth to be with Jesus. Isn't that going to be wonderful? No more struggles, no more tears, no more comfort needed. Okay? Because we will be in the seat of comfort. But this comfort that I speak of is not for everyone. Not everyone can experience this comfort. The rapture is not for everyone. There's some conditions, folks. And I want to share some of these conditions with us because I myself want to experience the comfort. I want to fly away, oh glory, one day when that trumpet sounds. But then we better find out if there are conditions, what are those conditions, and we better comply with those conditions. The first requirement, my precious brother and sister, is that you must be born again. If you're not born again, you won't fly anywhere. You'll be like on lockdown without a, a, a vaccine passport. You ain't going anywhere, okay? Praise God, I won't need a vaccine passport to fly away when that trumpet sounds if I'm born again. If you're born again, in a twinkling of an eye, in a moment of time, you will disappear from this earth and you will be with Jesus. So this morning I want to look at the book of Micah and see what he says the Lord expects of us. And it's quite a long reading, but it's, uh, I, you know, I normally cut out a lot of the readings, the studies that I do, and just bring, but this is so beautiful, I couldn't leave any of it out, so uh, just bear with me. And so Micah 6 verse 1 says, listen now, listen to God. This is God speaking to you, my friend. Take your stand in court. So as it were, you're in a courtroom now. You're standing before God. And God is the, the judge, and we're in this courtroom. And God says, if you have a complaint, is there anybody here that has a complaint against God? He says, tell the mountains. Make your case to the hills. Folks, God's calling nature to judge between us and Him as to who's right and who's wrong and who's fair and who's not fair. And now, mountains, hear God's case. He gave you your, uh, your chance. You could make your case to the mountain. But now God is himself going to speak to the mountain. And, and he says, hear God's case. Listen, jury earth, for I'm bringing charges against my people. I'm building a case against Israel. Dear people, how have I done you wrong? Have I burdened you, worn you out? Answer. 
Don't any of you put your hand up, please. <laughs> because I, I, I'm, I'm scared for you that you bring the wrong answer because we so easily can be burdened and weary and worn out. But this is the words of God. He, this is challenging me this morning. If you think I'm challenging you, I am more challenged than you are by these words because this is the word of God. I delivered you from the bad life of Egypt. In other words, I saved you. I paid a good price to get you out of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and Aaron and Miriam to boot. And then I added in italics, so why are you depressed? I know none of you are depressed. But folks, let's just be honest. Depression is gripping the world right now. Many people are depressed. Sometimes I feel like being a little depressed. When they lock up the church, it doesn't fill me with joy. All the things that are going on in the world, it seems like, God, when will you show your strong right arm and deliver us from all of this nonsense? And then it goes on. Remember what Bala, king of Moab, tried to pull and how Balaam, son of Bur, turned the tables on him. Remember all those stories about Shittim and Gilgal. Keep all God's salvation stories fresh and present. Folks, you need to encourage yourself with testimonies, with what God has done in your life, what you believe in God to do, because otherwise we can get into that space of depression. We can get into that space of, oh, woe is me. And God says, I, I call the mountains to judge between you and me. Have I done fairly by you or not? So, why? Uh, uh, it said there that Balak tried to pull a, 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 a trick on the Israelites. Why is Balak slipped in here? I mean, there's so many biblical stories that one could have brought in here. Why did God stick Balak right into the middle of this beautiful bit of scripture. Folks, it's because Balak tried to bribe God. He said to Balaam, curse the Jews. And Balaam said, I can't. And he said, well, can't we make some more sacrifices? Isn't there something we can do to twist God's arm that he'll allow us to curse these people? He tried to bribe God. I hope none of us ever try to bribe God. So, it goes on. What does the Lord require of you and I? Told you, first thing is you must be born again. But here's coming some more requirements. And Micah 6 verse 6 says, How can I stand up before God and show proper respect to the high God? Should I bring an armload of offerings topped off with yearling calves? Didn't I just tell you, uh, Balak and Balaam, they tried to bribe God, and now it's asking, what, what can I bring? Armloads of offerings, yearling calves. Would God be impressed with thousands of rams, with buckets and barrels of olive oil, and other translations says rivers of olive oil, would he be moved if I sacrificed my firstborn child, my precious baby, to cancel my sin? But he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. This is at the message, you can hear it, it's plain English. Nobody can tell me we don't understand it. This says, what God is looking for in men and women. I know the world is so confused today they don't know uh, that there's just men and women, but the Bible knows it. You're either a man or a woman, and he says what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Yeah, I'm going to give it to you now, folks. If you want to write something down, write this down. First of all, do what is fair and just to your neighbor. That's number one. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. 
take God seriously. That's in the message, folks. Folks, God is not looking for us to make bigger and better offerings, sacrifices. He's just looking for us to do the simple basics right. So what does God expect of you? Those three things, these points I'm taking out of the King James Version because um, I, I, I love the message, but it's a little flowery and I want to condense it. So I'm taking these points out of the King James. What does God expect of you? Number one, justice. Number two, kindness. Number three, humility before God. And these three build on each other. They are steps. So let's look at the three. To be just, to have justice, is wonderful. Isn't it nice if, if you think, that person is really fair. That's a fair person. Wouldn't you think that's a good thing? God says it's the foundation, it's not enough. It's not enough. Fairness is not enough. What's right is right, but God wants you to climb to the next step of kindness. He wants you to be just, but on top of being just, he wants you to be kind. That goes beyond what is just just. And something that we practice in our lives, and it's not always easy, because uh, sometimes you can get irritated in situations. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Our domestic worker uh, was uh, off uh, a day or two, and then she came back to work, and we really needed her that day. It was a big day because we had uh, a, a contractor working, and you know, they make a lot of mess, and um, we, we wanted her to sort of keep the place tidy where the contractor was working. Uh, and so we were so pleased that she came to work, and she was just there a few minutes when her phone rang, and somebody said her son at home had fainted. And so she came and told us this, and, and Rona said, well, what do you want to do? So she said, well, I, there are people there with him, so I, I'm just going to stay at work. Because, you know, uh, you, you can't also just keep on taking off and expect to get paid either, you know. But justice says that um, you, you can go home, but you, you don't have to be expect to be paid. But kindness says, what would I like my boss to do to me? And I remember back in the days when I worked at the magistrate's court, Rona phoned me in a panic and she said, our dog is about to have puppies. This wasn't even humans. And I don't know what to do. And I went to my boss and I said, my wife is panicking, can I go home? And he said, of course, just go home and go and sort it out, Nick. And off I went home to go and see... Uh, our, our dog having these puppies that looked like hyenas. I don't know where the hyena came from. But there was uh, definitely some hyena blood in there. Uh, and folks, kindness is treating people... Uh, you know, we could have said, well, uh, you can go home and then you're not going to get paid because you've already now taken a few unnecessary days. There's already been some problems. Uh, so justice is one thing. Kindness is the next level. Where not only did I say you can go home, I said get in my car, I'm going to take you home. Straight away. Because we don't have a contract that we fetch and carry off for work. She must find her own way to work and she must find her own way home. But in a situation like that, you go above and beyond what is just right to say, okay, you can go home. Then you add kindness to it and you say, I'm going to take you home quickly. And make sure, because I know if it was, if somebody phoned me to say, your daughter has fainted, she's in trouble, I'm not even going to ask if I can go. They will look for me and find me missing. And I will apologize afterwards. 
because it was an emergency. So, folks, justice is what God requires, that we be just. But he says, to justice, add kindness. He wants us to be kind. Uh, I'll never forget some days I was working far out of town on, on farms and whatnot, and the farmer would say to me, uh, come, it's lunchtime, come and sit with me and let's have lunch together. Uh, and then they'd say, let's pray, and they'd pray a blessing over the food and over me, and then we'd sit and eat together. And I just felt I'd been treated with kindness. You can't but help but like people like that. That's why when people come and work at our house, we try and feed them. It's, it's just kindness. It it's wasn't included in the contract. I didn't sign up with that farmer, when I'm finished working at your property, I expect the meal. No, that's going above and beyond what is expected and just being kind. So, it's one thing to be just and to be kind, but careful. Be very careful. There's a third step here. This third step is the most important step of the lot, because many of us have learned to be just, and we've learned to be kind, and with it we become arrogant. Because now, I'm a good person. I do good. But the Bible says, walk in humility before God. That's the third step. Humility. Folks, I don't want to be rude, but I've uh, met so many pastors that walk in arrogance. They just. They kind. But there's an arrogance there. And I don't want to be like that. So I want to humble myself this morning before you and before God. Lord, help me to walk humbly before you because any one of us can fall into this thing that you think you missed the big boots. I'm not pointing fingers at other people. This morning, I want to point fingers at myself. You know why? Because I want to fly away, oh glory. And I want the comfort of God. I want everything God's got for me. And if I want what God's got for me, then I've got to comply with the conditions that He put in His Word. Amen. You must be born again. If you're not born again, you're not even in the game. If you haven't acknowledged that you're a sinner and said, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins and come and dwell in me, then you're not born again and you're not going to heaven. But now we don't want to stay there at baby level. We want to grow. And to grow is to become just, to become kind, and to stay humble. So many Christians have the strong sense of justice, and many walk in kindness, but a superior attitude about their walk with God. I'm right. And the rest of you are idiots. That's the state of the church today, my friend. It's big time in the world. If you don't agree with my theology down to the last dot and tittle, then you're an idiot. Can there be space for other people to have different ways of serving the same God? Can there be space for those that still want to sing those most beautiful hymns and, and space for those that so enjoyed the worship this morning? Can we be different and still tolerate each other? God's looking for people that will humble themselves. Uh, that is why today I love to work with different denominations. I, I love to work with Anglicans. You see, we've had an Anglican minister come and minister here. I do it on purpose, not by mistake. Because they can bring some stuff to the party that 
we haven't even got a clue about. And we can bring something to them that they don't have a clue about. And together it's beautiful. But you have to humble yourself to do that. I love Presbyterians. I love Methodists. Baptists that are so strong in the Word. Folks, we need to keep our hearts humble and pure before God. Stop trying to go above and beyond. Oh Lord, I'm going to fast longer than anybody else. I don't even like fasting. People say, oh, I love fasting. I think, man, what is wrong with you? <laughs> fasting is a discipline where you... Uh, Absolutely do it because you love Jesus, not because you love fasting. You, you must be, there must be something wrong with you if you like. I like my food. <laughs> and if I give it up, it's a sacrifice. But it's because we get arrogant, folks. Even people that say, oh, I love the Word of God. It can be an arrogance. Careful, careful. You might be able to quote a hundred scriptures more than me, but is your heart humble? Because people that can quote most of the Bible, they get a bit arrogant. I've met a few of those. Micah's teaching this morning is stop trying to impress God. Don't we do that? Just get the basics right. That's all God is asking. You know, the gospel is not something difficult that you can't do. God is saying, here's three little steps. Follow these three steps. Mike is teaching you three steps. Get this right. Okay, so now let's go over to Numbers 24 verse 1 because I spoke to you about Balaam. But now Balaam realized that God wanted to bless Israel. So he didn't work in any sorcery as he had done earlier. He turned and looked out over the wilderness. As Balaam looked, he saw Israel camped by tribe, and the Spirit of God came upon him. It's an incredible scripture, this. And he spoke his oracle message. I, I love the way this is written. Decree of Balaam. Son of Boo, yes, the Cree of a man with 20-20 vision. This guy had no issues about who he was. I, I, I mean, we can sometimes be a bit insecure about who we are and our abilities. This guy says it so that it's eventually written in the very Bible itself. He says to the people, I got 20-20 vision. Wow. Goes on to say, this is a decree of a man who hears God speak. Who sees what the strong God shows him. Who falls on his face in worship. Who sees what's really going on. And then he makes a statement. He says, what, I mean, he'd just been giving you his uh, CV basically. Do you know who I am? I'm this 2020 vision man. I hear God. He first had to impress you with who he was. But now he goes on to say, What beautiful tents, Jacob. He was there to curse them. But he says, What beautiful tents. So, what was so lovely about their tent? Don't you want to know? I mean, you know, I read something like it. What beautiful tents. I wonder, were these made of sheepskin? Were they leather? What was... I, I, I mean, the way he's talking, you think this is a modern tent, eh? You can buy some nice tents today. Folks, he's not talking about uh, their ramshackle tents. They were on the move for 40 years in the desert, Okay. They had these little Lasmakar tents. He's talking about a dwelling place for a family. You see, God loves family. 
So although they wanted to curse the Israelites, this Balaam looks over them and he's thinking to himself, man, I'd get paid big bucks if I curse these people now. That's why he went. Because they tempted him. They said, man, we'll give you so much if you'll go and curse these people. And he wanted to. But God wouldn't allow him. And he looks out over the people and he says, wow, your tent is so beautiful. He's speaking about dwelling place and family. So, God loves family and the tent speaks of family and I want to tell you God loves when family gathers together as we are today. God loves this. God is looking at us today and He's well pleased with every one of you that has made the effort to come and dwell together. God loves family. Not just as a church, your family at home. If you'll gather with them and you'll teach them the three steps. You know, I, I've sat with Christian people. Uh, I, I'll never forget, I was at a breakfast just up the road here with some guys that, that I quite highly esteemed. I, I, I thought, man, this guy's really serving God. And he gets a phone call and he blatantly lies to the person in front of me. I'm sitting there, my jaw is saying, he says, no, I can't come now because I'm on the other side of Clement. I, I thought, my friend, either your geography is not good. <laughs> when you get off this call now, I'm going to help you with your geography. I said to him, you're not in Clement? He says, no, man, this person is a lust and I just... Uh, I said, well, tell them they're lust. Don't tell them you're in Claremont. You've got to be just. You've got to be kind. And you've got to walk humbly before your God. God, help me to walk in these things. The seven weeks of comfort that we are in now is not for everyone, but for those that love justice, practice kindness, and walk humbly before their God. Will you stand with me, please? Lord Jesus, your word is simple. It's not hard for us to understand. You just want us to get the basics right. You're not looking for us to bring rivers of olive oil and sheep and goats. And Jesus was the sacrificial lamb for our behalf. But you want us to be born again so that when that trumpet sounds, we can be with you and you want us to do these things that are on your heart. And you love family. You love it when people gather together. And where you are in the midst. And right now I sense your Holy Spirit is here. And I pray for each person that has taken the time to come here today. And each person that will watch this DVD, I pray for them that there will be an awakening in your church. Lord, especially in the area of humility. Lord, and don't start with this congregation. Lord, start with me. Do a work in me, Lord, because... I sometimes am not comforted. Sometimes I'm disquieted by everything that is going on around me. And it just tells me that I need to come aside 
and humble myself before a gracious and a good God. And so this morning, Lord, I pray that as I humble myself before you, that the congregation too would raise their hands and say, me too, Lord, me too. I humble myself before a living God. And Lord, don't let us be judgmental. Let us be gracious to every different opinion that is out there. Let us be gracious to people that see things differently to us. So that our life can be a sweet ointment in the earth. Lord, that's how your revival will come. Is when the church starts to give off a scent of the beauty of God in the midst of chaos. And so I bless this, your congregation. I plead the blood of Jesus over each person here. I pray for them this morning that you cause your face to shine upon them. Be gracious to them and give them your shalom. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. We love and appreciate you. And we look forward to seeing you next week.